of our um, webinar series, Google Apps for Education 101 webinar series. So today we'll be going into what can the Google Apps Control Panel do for me. And so when we're talking about what the Google Apps Control Panel can do for you, it's a lot about how can you leverage the Google Apps Control Panel for the, for the use of Google Apps for Education at your institution. And again, my name is Ariel Hathaway, and I am on the Google Apps for Education team. Okay. So we can go ahead and get started. Just one second. Okay. So this is a look at what the Google Apps Control Panel looks like. So as you can see, it's a Google Apps for Education account, so this is exactly what you would see on your end as well. This is the main dashboard, so this is what appears when you log into your Google Apps Control Panel. You can see here is the name of the organization, so you're able to specify this. And also it gives you if you have any subdomains or domain aliases attached. I will show you this information right here. It will tell you the number of users that you have. You can click on this to get to the list of users. It will also tell you the number of users that you're able to create with the account. So with um, accounts, you're going to have a certain number of users that um, you're going to be able to create. Um, and then you will be able to, if you need more users, you can always click the request more users, and then this will be processed by our teams in order to give you the allotted amount of users. And there's also a snapshot of the seven-day activity for users over the last 90 days, and we'll go into a little bit more, but this can really help you to understand how users are using your services, if they are using the services, if you need to... Um, give them access to other services. So let me just take a look. So it seems like, um, can other people see my screen? Okay, great. Um, and we'll be posting a recording, so that way if you, are, if you aren't able to see something, um, then you will be able to when we have that recording posted. Okay, so down here we can see service settings. So we can add more services, but if I click on this link, we'll be brought to a page where we can um, see what other services are available that we haven't added. Um, we've added most of the services, but you can always add things um, that it may be in lab format or maybe something that's in the marketplace. You'll also see down here, you'll see what services we do have enabled. So um, email, docs, calendar, site, chat, video. Um, and within here, you can go into any of these, and you'll get the subsettings for the service. So you would have, you can, we'll go into this in a bit more detail later, but with an email, you would be able to set up email settings for that. This will show you the URL that users will go to access, and these are something that you can change. So, for example, this one hasn't been changed, so it's mail.google.com slash a slash internationalwildcats.org. But docs has been changed, so it's a short link of docs.internationalwildcats.org. And then any apps from the Google Apps Marketplace that you've added will appear down here. And so the Google Apps Marketplace, I just want to touch on this slightly. So um, in January, we released an education-specific version of, or an education-specific section of the Google Apps Marketplace. So this is a great place to leverage um, tools that partners have built. You can look there for tools that partners have built that are specifically pertaining to education. Within the Marketplace, um, you can also do that as well. So um, I mean, sorry, within the marketplace, you can see what other things are there that people have built for businesses or just in general for the Google Apps control panel. Okay. So let's take a look at the Organizations and Users tab. So the Organizations and Users tab is going to give you information about the organizations and users that you have set up within your domain. So this is going to be um, where you can specify where you can add new users if you're doing it through the control panel. So you see that you can create new users here. Um, and as you can see on this slide, so we have the internationalwildcats.org domain, which is the parent domain, and then we have the different organizational units within there. So these users that are here are at the top level. They're not necessarily part of an organization. And then faculty, students, and tests. So those are different organizations. And then within each organization, so let's go to the faculty organization or the students. 
So the student's organization only has one user in it right now. But let's take a look here. So what you can do is you can say, I want to go into services. Within services, you are going to have certain services turned on for your domain um, that you've added through your dashboard. But then within that, you can turn on or off services. So I can say, I'm going to turn off contacts for this group, or I'm going to turn off Gmail for this group. So if you want to do that, if you want to do something different than is currently available to your users, you would say override the setting, and then you can change that. So this is a great way if you're putting in, if you want certain users to have access to certain services, but you don't want other users to have access to these services, this is how you can accomplish that. And then and other Google services. So with the rollout of the full Google account, um, the new infrastructure, um, there are the additional services that users can also access. And so this is something that you can also change on a per user or a per group basis. So um, additional things like blog or things of that nature. And there is the note that these aren't covered by the Google Apps Customer Agreement that, and they don't fall under the same technical um, support services. But you can go ahead and add these or choose not to add these for your users. So if we go back to the users tab. So as you can see right here, if you want to add another sub-organization, you can do that. So you can have students, and then you could have, say, class of 2011, class of 2012, class of 2013. You can go ahead and add those um, in, into as much detail as possible. What we've also seen some schools do is they might um, have to say, this is an organization of users who are going to have access to this service. So this is, this is my docs-only organization, and then this is my email site organization. So you can also go ahead and do that if that makes more sense than perhaps doing faculty, students, things of that nature. So um, within here as well, so if I select Jennifer, I can say move to, and I can move her to a different organization if I want to do that. I can also delete the users that I've selected here. Um, Download users as a CSV. This is going to depend on the size of the institution that you're at. And if you're at a um, large institution, this is something that you would want to do through some of our reports. But if you're depending on the size of your domain, you can do this. Um, and then bulk upload users. So a bulk upload user um, would be through the CSV file. So I can, we can move on to the groups tab now. And if you create a new user through the control panel, basically what you're doing is you're specifying first, last name, um, the username, and then the password. Okay, so we've spoken a bit about groups in some of the earlier webinars in terms of how groups can be used in order to, um, from the user side. But there are different ways to create groups. So you can create groups through the control panel, and then you can also create groups through the um, user managed group service. So groups created through the control panel, um, you can create either on a one-by-one -one basis through the control panel, you can create um, with the provisioning API, you can create with the Google Apps Directory Sync tool. But basically here, I'm going to be able to see the groups that are in my domain. I'm going to be able to see the type of group. Um, I can click on, say, Comp 101, for example. And when I click on Comp 101, I'm going to be able to see who the members are, who the owner is, um, and then if I click on Access Settings, then I'm going to be brought into the group service for that front outline of Access Settings. Okay. So here I can add people as members. I can add people as owners here. Um, I can remove specific members, um, set, the, set myself to be an owner, um, things of that nature. Okay. Okay, then domain settings. We'll take a look at domain settings next. So domain settings are going to be the general settings for your domain. So for example, you may have, um, you may want to change your organization name. Um, if you, if the name of your school is renamed something of that sort, you would change your organization name. Um, this is going to appear um, when people are logging in, if you're using the default login page, things of that nature. 
Um, the contact information. So we ask you to designate uh, the contact email address for service communication. Um, so this is supposed to be the primary administrator account on the domain. So this would be somebody who is provisioned within the domain. And then also a secondary email address that is outside of the domain. And what the secondary email address is used for is for things to, um, like password recovery, um, and password um, reset if you forget your password, things of that nature. So you can opt out if you don't want this email address to be used for that, but we do want that secondary email address that is outside of the domain. Additionally, you can specify user support text. And so what this is is that this can be information. So if a user is having difficulty logging in and they're using the default, the default Google login instead of single sign-off, and you can have some additional information. So you can say, please contact the help desk between this, these hours and on these days at this extension. So that is something that you are able to do. We do note that this is publicly accessible, so you might want to just put the ex um, extension and not the whole phone number, or if you're putting somebody's email address, and you just might want to be cognizant of whose email address you're putting there. You can set the default language for users. Users can go in and change this once they're in their account, but you can set the default language for users. You can also set the default time zone as well. And for ads that are hiding all advertisements, if you could opt out of that if you did want ads to be shown, but my guess is that most people would want to hide all ads. You can enable SSL. So you can automatically enforce SSL when users connect to services, um, Gmail docs, calendar site, so that that way um, it's going to be the HTTPS in the URL, not an HTTP um, URL. So that's just one important thing that you can enable or disable. Um, it can be slightly slower when it's over SSL, but it is more secure. And then new services and pre-release features. So new services and pre-release features, is, this is important because we just recently released that new release track. So um, you can choose to automatically add new services when they become available. Um, we can enable scheduled releases. So when you enable scheduled releases, you're going to um, have basically weekly releases, and you will um, be notified so that way you can get that information from the um, what's new about google.com, and you can get that information. You have that week to prepare change any help desk documentation, things of that nature if you want to. You also get to select the version of the control panel that you'll be using. So the current version, which would be um, if you're using um, uh, non-US English, then you would use the current version of the control panel. However, there are some, if you're using US English, then you can opt to use the next generation control panel, and there'll be some new features that will be available earlier than in the current version of the control panel. Here you can also opt in to receiving emails um, and about whether or not you're willing to be contacted. So sometimes we'll send out surveys of how is people's Google Apps experience, um, and so you can opt in or out of these things here. So account information. The account information is um, pretty straightforward. It's just going to tell you what the Google Apps certification account is and what the default country is. That's going to be set when you um, first set your account, and then um, the Google Apps certification is based on the addition of Google Apps later on. For domain names, generally what this will say is you, most people are not going to have this. This is a domain that was purchased um, through either GoDaddy or Enon. We have partnerships with both of them in order to purchase domains. So, and um, my guess is that most of you would probably already have domains that you're signing up. Uh, you would already have the domains that you're signing up for a Google Apps account for. So because you already own these domains, then you would not be purchasing it through either one of these. But if you did, um, you can get a standard edition account that way that would then be upgraded to an education edition account. Um, but this just shows you that this is a, something that was purchased through Enom. Um, so you can access the DNS through here. But so this shows that internationalwildcats.org is the primary domain. And then you have internationalwildcats.bigr.info, and this is a domain alias. So we'll talk about the differences between a domain and a domain alias. So um, a domain is going to be an additional domain that a user can have a separate account on. Um, you could have your alumni, and so that way you can have John Smith at alumni, which is different from John Smith at school.edu. The way that these are differentiated is quite subtle. So um, 
I have had some schools that have been slightly confused when they've been doing this. Um, I have encountered some schools, so this is something that is important to note. So um, when you add a domain, it's going to associate um, a new domain with the account. And if you use a domain, you're going to be able to create, it's going to be a separate entity, so it's going to be within the same Google Apps control panel, but it's going to be for users who may be um, not within the same company, or, or sorry, not within the same school. You could technically have a broader level, so you could have this is a school district and then this is the elementary school, this is the middle school, or with for uh, college or university, you could have this is the college or university and then this is the school of business, this is the school of medicine. A domain alias, on the other hand, is going to be, it's going to add that for all of your users. So I would type that in, and then if I wanted to be an alias, so this is something that all of my users on my domain are going to receive mail at, or are going to be able to receive mail at, then I just want to check this box. So it's a pretty subtle difference, but you just need to be aware of that when you are adding a domain or a domain alias to make sure that you've done it the correct way for what you want to do. Then user settings. So for user settings, you want to um, take into account what things certain users will see. So contact sharing. Uh, you can choose to enable or disable contact sharing. And what contact sharing is, is that if you have contacts turned on, um, it's going to allow people to search that the contact list for your domain. Additionally, um, if you have if you don't have contact sharing turned on, or if you do have contact sharing turned on, sorry. And you're going to have the autocomplete. So if you started to type AR, you would be um, likely have my name pop up. So this is going to be helpful when people are sending emails. Um, there are some schools that will opt to disable contact sharing. So that this means that um, you're not going to have that autocomplete functionality until somebody has emailed somebody um, on a regular basis or until they've emailed the person. Um, but this is something that you can opt in or out of. Also, if you're using the provisioning API, this is where you can turn on access to the provisioning API. Also, you can go to um, have configure single sign-on from here. This is also available in the advanced tool, so we can go there from there. And then adjusting password settings. So one thing that you can do with password settings is that you can specify um, some unique characteristics um, in terms of how long they need to be. So you can make the minimum length longer, or you can make um, – the maximum length shorter. So you can say, I don't want my users to have a password that's more than 20 characters. And if that's the case, then you would just um, make sure that you select that. So at, enter 20 as the maximum length, and then that would be the way that you would set that up. For monitoring, what you're able to do is you're able to um, look in here and see the password strengths for different users and also their password link. So we recently, within the past few weeks, changed the password length, the minimum password length, to eight characters. So you'll see that the ones that are six characters are going to be marked in red, and these users are going to have to change that um, the next time they change their password. So you can also get the last signed in, and you're only going to get um, the password change for a user who has signed in. But one thing, when we're while we're talking about um, password strength and things of this sort. I can also show you in organizations and users. I realized that we didn't actually go into what a user would look like there, but let me go ahead and do that now. Okay, so we can go into my account on here. Okay. So here we're going to have the user information of user. So we're going to have the person's name. So you can ch always change this name. So this is going to be the display name. Um, and then this is my primary email address. So one question that often comes up is how can you change the primary email address, the username associated with the person? So this can be done with the provisioning API, and then it can also be done with some of the marketplace tools that are available. So if you go into the Google Apps Marketplace and search for a user rename, there are some tools that will come up. And um, there's a tool by um, called Sherpa Tools by Cloud Sherpas, and that is a free user rename tool. So you can use that. You can install that on your control panel if you want to be able to rename users. Here you can also change the password for a user. 
And then if you do, so if a user calls in and they say, I need my password changed, you can change the password right here. You can also require a change of password the next sign-in. So if they called and wanted their password changed, you can say, okay, I'm going to change it to the temporary password, but they're going to have to change it the next time. You can also reset signing cookies, and this will prompt the user to sign in again. So if the user said, um, you know what, uh, I gave my password to somebody who I shouldn't have given my password to. Now I think that they're in my account. Um, I want to make sure that you change my password in order to um, be able to have that person leave the account, then you can do that. So you can reset sign-in quickly, change the password required and password the next time the user signs in, and that could potentially help that. You can see password strength here. So you can also see when the user last logged in, how long their, their password was, what the strength rating was. Um, here, with contact sharing, you can opt specific users out of contract contact sharing. So you can untype this box if you don't want this user to be shared in the contact sharing. Um, Two-factor authentication, you can see if, um, if the user has turned it on, if you've enabled them to turn it on. You can also see the email code that's being used, any nicknames for the user, the groups that the user belongs to, and also if you want to specify specific email routing for a user, you can do that here. So you can say it's going to inherit any routes from um, the domain as a whole. Um, I could say I don't want it delivered to Google Apps, things of that nature. You can go ahead and do that, or you can specify another destination on a per user basis. So you can also see um, the different services that the users are the user is using, and then also for privileges, if you want to make somebody an administrator, you can just go to privileges and then check this box, and you'll be able to make them an administrator of the domain. Okay, we can go back to domain settings. There's one more thing on domain settings that I'll show you. So appearance. So you may want to have, um, you can use the default logo, or you can use um, a custom logo. So if you use a custom logo, all of the default logos, so for Gmail, Calendar, um, are going to be replaced with that custom logo. Um, so when you are uploading a custom logo, it is important to note that it's going to be for all services and that it has to be a specific size. So you do want to make sure that when you're uploading it, it is that size. So all you have to do here is choose a file and then upload. It can take a little bit of time to propagate. Um, if you're not seeing it propagate, you know, clear caching cookies, um, sign back in, and you should be able to see it. You can also specify what, you're, what you want for the sign-in box color. So this would be if you're using the default Google Apps um, sign-in page. So you can um, specify this color so that, that way when users are logging into your domain, they can have a specific color um, with a specific border and outline. So those are just some simple customizations that can be done. If you want further customizations on that of the login screen, then you can do that if you have SSO enabled. So with advanced tools, this is where some of the more um, complex features of the Google Apps Control Panel can be found. So here you can see that I have the ability to do my bulk upload here. I can also download the directory sync tool as well. So these are some important things to note just because um, if you are doing these um, using one of these methods, this is where you can do it from. Authentication. So there's a whole section on authentication. So one thing is, is for single sign-on, if I want to set up single sign-on, I would specify um, that I want to enable single sign-on. I would then put a sign-in page URL, a sign-out page URL, and a change password URL. Upload the verification certificate, um, and then, <laughs> sorry, um, and then I can say whether I'm using a domain-specific issuer, um, any network masks that I need to put in. Um, there's also a link to SSO reference. So you can, if you're not familiar with single sign-on, you can also look at the single sign-on reference material. 
Um, it is one of the more technically complicated pieces, so depending on what resources you have at your school, you may want to look into hiring a partner to do this aspect of your deployment. One other note is that if you populate the team's password URL, so I can basically put any URL here, um, and I don't enable single sign-on, then users, if they are going to change their password, will be pushed to whatever I've specified in this uh, change password URL, which means that you can effectively prevent users um, from changing their password through Google Apps if you don't want them to do that. So again, then there's advanced password settings. You can also manage your OAuth domain key. So when you are managing your OAuth domain key, um, this will allow users to, uh, sorry, administrators to access user data um, without their password. So this can, will be done for certain things like the email settings API, you're going to need this um, domain key. If you're using the audit API, you're also going to need this. And so basically you can, um, enable the consumer key, and then also regenerate this. Um, so it's just important to note that if you are going to be using certain APIs, you are going to need to do this. Also, you should, uh, if you are using APIs, you need to check allow access to all APIs there. For federated login using Open ID, um, this can allow users to sign into third-party sites um, using their Google Apps credentials. So this is something that you, um, and it won't give away their credentials. So, it, but it will use their Google Apps account, and basically it will send that authorization token to whatever um, application it is that they're trying to access. So this, this is something that you can turn on or off for users. Um, and then you can manage third-party OAuth access. So if you are going to be using um, third-party applications, things of that sort, this is where you can set that up. Reporting. So reporting, I think, is probably one of the most useful um, tools within the Google Apps Control Panel. Um, and something that a lot of people, and I think it's one of the most useful tools that people don't necessarily know about and use all the time. So you have your usage and reports, and this is going to give you email activity, so it'll tell you the total number of accounts, the activity in the last day, the activity in the last week, the activity in the last two weeks, and the activity in the last 30 days, and you can do this for various periods of time. You can put it in a table or in a CSV format, so you can really get a lot of user data from here. You can see login activity for various services for one day, seven day, 30 day, there's also um, a Google Apps reporting API that you can use to get some of this information. Um, so you can use that, but there are a number of reports built into Google Apps Control Panel that you can also use. So service usage. Um, you can see the total quota for your domain in megabytes, and then also what the total usage is for your users. Average mail usage. You can see collaboration summary reports, the type of docs that are being created, how many users the docs are shared with, who the, um, how many people are creating a number, certain numbers of docs, the types of docs that are created by day. Um, you can you just get a lot of data from here. So, for example, if you're interested in, you know, presenting um, you know, a check-in of we've been on Google Apps for three months and we want to see um, how people are using it. Um, this is a great resource to be able to get these graphs and really show people at your institution how people are using it, what people are using it for, how they're um, sharing things. Um, it, it can also get you really useful information in the event that you don't think that your users are using it that much to say, how can we make users use this feature more or this functionality more? We see that they're creating a lot of documents, but we don't see them creating a lot of spreadsheets. What's the reason for that? And then the additional reports tab. So with the additional reports, um, you can get account reports. So you can get um, lists of all the accounts that exist in your domain on a specific day. And so this is going to be active and inactive. So 
If you, if you wanted to see all the accounts that are suspended, you can do that. Also, activity reports. So this is going to um, give you some more details on that. And um, this space, so you can see how much this space is being used. Email clients, and um, how are users accessing? Are they accessing you a pop connection to an email client? Things of that sort. And then also summary reports. So this will give you their total, a user's total mailbox um, usage. So you can figure out, you know, is somebody getting close to their quota. So the reason I think that these reports are so important is because you can get so much data. This data is there for you, and then you're going to be able to use this data to better serve the people, the faculty staff, the students who are at your school. I think that that's it's just really valuable, and the data that you can get there is just going to help a lot in terms of if you are making your case, in terms of how Google Apps, Google Apps has been able to um, affect your institution, um, or also if people are just asking for that data, you can get that really easily from here. Okay, so now back to advanced tools. So you also have the ability to set up FreeBusy, so um, the FreeBusy service. So if you are using um, a dual environment, so you have some people who may be on Exchange and some people who may be on Google Apps, you can use the Google Calendar Connector um, tools in order to set up FreeBusy so that that way users on Exchange can query Google Apps calendar information and users on Google Calendar can query um, the Exchange calendar information. So you can use a secure data connector if you want Google Apps to access certain data on your local network. So this is something that you can set up here as well. Email migration. So with email migration, if you're interested in learning more about the email migration tools, this is available in advanced tools as well. Um, so the, you can see what the Google Apps migration tools are. You can see, um, you can learn more about them. You can also um, see what the tools are that we support migrations from, or what the search systems are that we support migrations from. And um, we did have an INET migration tool, and it is still in the control panel, but we are deprecating it as of April 30th, 2011. So um, we recommend using the Google Apps Migration for Exchange tool, um, which also works for IMAP servers. There's an IMAP component of the tool. So that's just important to note because um, that's what you would be able to see the migration history through your control panel if you were using the INAP migration tool. However, this tool will be deprecated. So we, if you are using that, we recommend switching to the other tool sooner rather than later. So here we can um, say whether we're using the provisioning API, reporting API, email migration API, um, and this will give us the reference material for the use API. Um, Google Apps desktop features, so this allows certain users to access certain, uh, to download certain desktop features. You can get more information there, send out the file, um, or send out the link that users can use to set that up. User email upload. If you are using um, certain of the client-side migration tools, so if you are using Google Apps Sync for Microsoft Outlook or Google Apps Migration for Microsoft Outlook, then you want to make sure that um, user that you have checked this box so that users are going to be able to actually use it. So this is really important when you're doing client side migrations that you've elected that users can actually use this tool. So restricting email delivery. This is something that was released rather um, recently, and this allows you to say. Um, I'm going to add an organization of users, and I'm going to restrict where they can um, exchange email, addresses with, with which they can exchange email. Um, so you can say, I'm only going to allow email to people in this domain or to people at this other school. So this is really pertinent in the K-12 space, um, as it is able to create this wall garden approach to sending email and receiving email, especially for younger students. And then authenticating email, so you can set up um, DTIM in terms of email authentication. So this will um, configure domains whose email you want to authenticate. So this is an extra step that can be used in order to make sure that um, 
people can verify the sender of the domain, of the email so that they can say, oh, this is actually is from this um, person that's supposed to be. It's not from somebody who's spoofing their address. And then, so if you are just thinking about beginning your deployment, um, we recently released the setup guide. And so the setup wizard is really useful because it basically brings you through a lot of the steps of a Google Apps um, deployment. So you can go through the wizard. You can um, confirm domain name. It shows you how to create users, set up groups. So this is a really valuable resource if you're going through, you know, setting up a test domain and you just want some additional step-by-step -step guidance as you can, you know, set up different parts. So you can learn about migrating mail. You can learn about setting up calendars. And you can learn about how you're going to educate your users and support your users. So this is a really valuable guide that's available to you within the Google Apps Control Panel now. So instead of having to reference things that are in the Help Center, um, you can always reference those things in the Help Center, but we've tried to make it a little bit more centrally located so that that way you can have a one-stop shop for a lot of your questions that are going to come up. So within the support tab, um, you have it'll show you your admin help center, also where the community forum is for admin advice, um, and then the end user help center. So this is something great, a great place to point your users to if they have any questions. And then also um, with email and phone, you'll be able to get your customer pin and your support pin. So if you are submitting a support case or calling into the support line, you will need to provide this information. So if you need to submit a case, you can classify your case, and it will basically guide you through how you're going to submit your case. Additionally, if you want to have um, technical consulting from a partner, then you can select um, this link, and it will bring you to the marketplace, so that way you can look at some of the partners that are available for use in this case. So we'll take a look at service settings. So service settings is going to let you see what the service settings are for the specific service that you have, done, have turned on for your domain. So for example, here you can change the, the way users are accessing email, so you can change this URL. You can also select a name format. So do you want users um, to be their first name, last name, or last name, first name? You can also allow users to customize the settings. So if you don't want this setting to be the same for all users, and that's fine, you can always um, do it that way. You can choose whether you're enabling um, offline Gmail for your users, labs, um, different types of searching capabilities. Are you enabling voice and video chat? The Google Apps Sync and Google Apps Connector for users are going to allow that. So this would be for a BlackBerry Enterprise server and then for Outlook. Email whitelisting, email routing, and outbound gateway and inbound gateway. These are very important when it comes to your mail routing and also um, just in terms of mail delivery, things of that nature. So an email whitelist is going to be um, IP addresses that you expect your users to be receiving emails from. So this might be if you're using some type of learning management solution that sends out emails, you might want to put the IP addresses of the that learning management system within this, because this will help to make sure that they're not incorrectly classified as spam and that they're classified correctly. For email routing, this is how you can set up if you're within a, a dual delivery um, or split delivery environment. You can say, I'm going to add another destination here. You would specify what that server is, um, and then you can say deliver email for unknown accounts, so that would be split delivery. Provisioned accounts, that would be um, if you were just sending it dual delivery for those accounts that were, or you were just sending through for those accounts who are provisioned, and then all accounts would be for everybody who, both those accounts who are not, and who are on the domain and not on the domain. So outbound gateway, if you are using, um, you want to route mail all to your outbound uh, SMTP server, this is where you would do that. And additionally, an inbound gateway. So if you are using an inbound gateway, so this means that if you're using, if you're routing all of your mail through a server, then you are going to want to specify those IP addresses of that server in the inbound gateway. So that way they can be handled correctly. It can improve spam handling, things of that sort. 
So one important thing is that um, if you are using Postini, we provide the uh, Postini SP addresses that you would use. Um, also, if you're using Postini, you could populate you would populate um, the Postini server information in the outbound gateway as well. So that way, outbound mail would also go through Postini. So you can also set up an outbound relay. So when users are configuring a custom front address within Google Apps um, or a custom sender's address, and one option to them is whether or not they're going to send it through an external SMTP server. So this is something that you can say yes or no, depending on what your needs are of your organization. Here I can disable pop and IMAP access for my users. I can decide whether mail delegation is turned on or off. I can decide whether users are going to be able to use um, their own themes. And then I can disable email as well. So most of these are shorter than email, so. So for chat settings, um, you can um, determine what the sharing settings are for users. So you can say, I want users to only be able to chat with people who um, are inside or outside the domain. And um, you can also warn users if they're chatting outside of the domain and, and also display users' chat status outside of the domain. So if, the, if you're opting not to display users' chat status outside of the domain, that means that it doesn't matter whether I'm, um, if I have a status message there with maybe a link to something specific, that the, the people who are outside of the domain are not going to be able to see that. You can also choose to disable chat history by forcing all chats to be off the record for your domain. This is also on a, if you do have this, um, not selected, then users can also choose whether they want their chats on or off the record as well. And then for chat invitations, you can choose whether you're going to automatically accept chat invitations between users in the organization. And, and then users, again, can do this on their own so that I can say, I don't want to auto accept, even though that is the setting for the domain. If you have that unchecked, then that means that all users will have to accept. So if you, have, say, for example, have professors that don't want their students adding them on chat all the time, then that can be, um, you can do that. For calendar settings, and you have the ability to, again, change the URL for calendar access. You can also determine how information is going to be shared, um, whether you're sharing only free for the information outside of the domain um, or the Google Apps domain, um, sharing all information or but not allowing outsiders to change or sharing all information that outsiders can change. And then also you can set with internet, uh, within the um, Google Apps domain, so how will users um, – how will the defaults be? Will user calendars be shared? Will it only be free busy? Will it be all information that is shared? And then again, the free busy service can be accessed here. From here, you can go to resources. And within resources, you can create new calendar resources. Um, so I can take a look at this. So the Dell projector. And with the Dell projector, so I can change this resourcing if I need to. I can change the resource type. I can put some information in the description. And then I, this is the email address. So this is going to be what's used to access the calendar. And if I'm the administrator of that resource, I can always grant access to that. So that way users don't have to have that whole address. And with resource calendars, one thing that is important to note is that if you are creating them, it can take 24 hours for them to actually appear in the list of resources that are available to users. And so the screen seems to be a bit behind um, my talking. Um, we'll see. Uh, I'll be posting this, so when I post it, hopefully I'll be able to sort that out. Um, and I apologize for any confusion there. Okay. 
silver dock settings, again, you can decide whether users are going to be able to share outside of the Google Apps domain or not. Um, you can um, decide if they are sharing outside, are you going to warn them, are you going to allow them to publish documents. And then also within the organization itself, you can say, I want all these documents to be private. I want, this is the default. So this is, again, the users can change these settings um, on a per document basis, but this is something that you can set as a default. And one thing to note is that you might want to err on the side of, you know, you make them private, and then you just have to make them public. And while that can mean that they may get more emails, you know, you didn't give me access to the stock, it also may prevent things from that people, things that people did not want to share um, from being shared. And then you can enable templates, so users can submit templates for use by the Google Doc, uh, for the Google Apps domain. Um, and then also you can create different categories for these templates. Okay. And then groups, user managed groups. So the reason user managed groups um, has its own page is so that that way you can decide, you know, whether you're going to have these groups be public on the internet, whether they're going to be private, um, whether they're going to be uh, who can create groups, so whether anyone on the internet can create them, whether anyone in the domain can, and whether only domain admins can. You can also add a suffix, which can be extremely useful, because when you add a suffix, you can really easily denote what the user created group versus a group that was created through the control panel. So from here, um, you can, uh, Select, I'm going to have this as user, I'm going to have this as um, student, I'm going to have this as faculty staff. You can specify whatever that suffix is, and that can be really useful in just making sure that you can differentiate easily between what types of groups are user created. Also, that means a user can create a group called president at your domain um, because it would say president user. So that would be a, a hint to users that it wasn't actually the president. You can also select whether you want group owners to be able to allow members from outside of the domain to use the groups, um, whether you're allowing incoming mail, and then also whether groups are going to be hid um, from the group's directory. Let's go to sites and contacts. So for sites, again, you have the sharing setting. So this is going to be able to say this is the highest level of sharing for the users. So whether or not they can make their sites public, this is something that's really important. And do you want your users to be able to post their sites on the web, or is it something that you want to make sure that they are not going to um, be setting up on the web? Do you want it to just be internal? You have templates right here. So you can enable custom templates. Um, you can decide if you want to highlight custom templates that have been uploaded by you. Um, what are the categories available? And then web address mapping. So with web address mapping, um, if you wanted to create a site for your school, so say www.school.edu, you would use web address mapping to map that to a Google site, and then people would be able to access that site by going to www.school.edu. And so for Start Page, so there was a question about iGoogle. So if you have Start Page enabled, this is going to be stored by iGoogle. And so you can um, change the URL that users can access the Start Page at. But iGoogle is a highly individualized setting, or sorry, um, a highly individualized service. So this is going to be the users are able to specify which gadgets are going to be on iGoogle, um, things of that nature. If you are looking for a more um, Start Page field where you get to push more information out to your users where they can also customize as well, then there is a start page um, template within Google Sites that you can use. So um, I can send out some more information on that if that is helpful to some people. But that's um, it's in the Help Center as well, so you can also feel free to look that up.
So we've gone through most of the main service settings. We can take a look at contacts really quickly. Um, but this is a pretty short service setting section um, for the contacts. And if people have any questions that they want to add in, um, feel free to ask me. And um, so basically this is where you can disable the service. Um, you can also whether you can select whether you want to have a new contact manager or not. So, I mean, a lot of the service settings, so I would say the service settings that you really want to take a look at carefully are going to be the email service settings, the docs, and um, sites. Um, and chat probably just to make sure that those are set up correctly in terms of how you're sharing information um, and how you're, you want your users to share information. But for most um, cases, for a lot of them, you you can feel free to go through all of the service settings, but for some of them, you may not be making very many changes. Some of them will be like contacts where there aren't very many options in terms of what you're going to do um, just because it's a pretty it's pretty straightforward in terms of how contacts are going to be addressed within your domain. So um, feel free to um, I would definitely recommend you know register for a test domain, play around with the control panel, um, look up things in our in our help center, um, and then just play around with all the different tabs, see what all the different tabs do, and we'll be posting the webinar as well, so that that way you have access to. Um, my overview of the different areas of the control panel. And I want to thank everyone for their patience when I was dealing with my computer issue as well. So thank you very much. Um, let me just take a look at some questions. Okay, so there's a question about can users be part of more than one organization? So no, um, they can't be part of more than one organization. So at this time, organizations, they're, um, they mainly function for that service on-off functionality. And because they function for that service on-off functionality, they're only going to be able to be a part of one organization because otherwise, um, if they were, if they had access to say, um, and if they were in an organization that had access to docs and they were in another organization that didn't have access to docs, that would be conflicting. So basically what you'd want to do is uh, make sure that users are only in one organization at this point in time. Um, so it's not the same thing as in your LDAP structure, you may have users who are part of Google organizational units. It's not that same type of structure. Um, here in Google Apps, they're only going to be uh, have in one organization. Um, and then how do you register for a test domain? So if you want to register for a test domain, um, you can go to google.com slash a slash edu. That will bring you to the Google Apps for Education edu site. And from there, you can um, say sign up for Ask My School, and then there will be a button that you can click, and then you can go through the registration process. So if you use um, – so you could say test.school.edu um, – um, you do need access to the DNS, so if you are setting it up, you may need to work with your IT department at your school um, to verify domain ownership, but um, you're more than welcome to do that. Additionally, um, if you wanted to sign up for another test address, you know, you could just speak with some people at your school about um, signing up for multiple. If you're an educational institution, you can get uh, more than one domain as well. Okay, so um, so with there's another question about iGoogle for Google Apps. So I will send out some information about iGoogle and how that works with Google Apps. Um, so iGoogle is primarily it's going to be something that you as an administrator you can have your users access it certain ways, but you're not going to denote what your users are going to have on iGoogle. So let me send out some more information on that, and and I think that you can find that information helpful. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone again for attending, and thank you very much for your patience as I work through my uh, computer issues, um, and I hope to see some of you next week at our um, last, the fourth and final webinar on um, Google Apps Marketing and Project Planning. Thank you.